You always have to be open to something being better than what you just thought, even if it's what you think of in a week. Yeah. Which makes you throw out what you really believed in last month. I would like to just kind of chat a little bit about how y'all got started and just, you know, the industry is so different now and it's kind of a crazy time in this industry, TV, streaming and everything. But when y'all got started, what was it that kind of drove y'all to really get interested in the craft, in movies and cinema? And then how did you actually get into screenwriting specifically? Well, Rich, your story is more interesting than mine. So let me just kick, get mine out of the way. Um, so I uh, was a struggling uh, stand-up comedian in, in New York after college in the mid-late 90s. Um, after a couple of years of doing that with no success, I was giving up my dreams of being a cast member on Saturday Night Live and figured my best way in was I, I knew I could kind of write decent jokes and so I put together a packet of monologue jokes and would send them to Saturday Night Live to, you know, for their weekend update. I would send them to Letterman in hopes of getting a job there. And then I heard about a new show that was starting. It was called The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. And this is 1999. And I sent a packet of jokes into there. And thankfully, uh, Craig liked them. And so I, I came out to Los Angeles with a job and uh, have been writing uh, professionally ever since and was, again, lucky enough to get on Family Guy in 2004, uh, having met Seth at another job and have been clutching uh, the desk with my, my fingernails ever since. So uh, having a great time. Awesome. I would love, uh, you know, I, I don't, I know you don't have so, too much time, but one thing that I do kind of like to do, if the, if you if you guys are cool with going into some of this stuff, is a, a lot of our community, you know, we try to we try to just help people stay inspired and kind of motivated because, like you were just saying with your story, you had that period of time where you weren't finding the success that you wanted. So I would love to get any any tips or any maybe advice that you could give to someone who's young in their twenties, not finding success, very passionate, like. What advice would you give them to keep them going and not giving up and leaving and moving back home or whatever? Like, what are a couple of tips that you could give us? Well, I, I'll say that there are tips and there's also uh, reassurance. I don't think Alec and I know a successful comedy writer who hasn't been fired at least once or whose shows haven't been canceled, at least speaking for myself, three times. It's just a part of the experience to quote unquote fail, but it's not failing. It's somehow it's a disappointment or it might be something that doesn't pan out. So first there's a lot of company. And second, you know, it's the same old rule that I'm sure Alec followed as well as I did, which is just keep at it and keep writing. And the advantage that people today have that I did not have is there's so many outlets now when I was, starting out in 94, if I hadn't gotten an agent to read my material, I wouldn't have gotten out of the gate. I, let's hope he likes it or she likes it, but if you don't get an agent, then submit you. And then on the stack of uh, scripts, if that show editor doesn't, there, there's nothing to do. And today people, I, I mean, I'm the only social media I'm on is Instagram because my kids got on it. And I can't afford any more time to join, you know, TikTok or Twitter. But you just scroll through Instagram. There are so many things that make me laugh out loud that people post. We've hired someone at Family Guy based on his Twitter account. Seth, who oh. is on Twitter, was following uh, a writer named Damien Fahey and kept sending me his stuff. And, you know, we brought him in and he's developed into, you know, a really strong writer and presence at the show. And wow. people, you know... It's not just that showrunners like me and Alec read things. I'll get links sent to me. We'll follow up. So what I would say to people is produce stuff. You have your phone, make little short videos. <clears throat> Something is going to get out there if it's really funny and really good or creative and just find that platform, that venue. Yeah, that's, that's really like amazing. The Twitter story of you found someone on Twitter. That's, must Seth be said, I have to say, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, like that's, yeah. Just, yeah. We're, we're always looking for stuff like that. You know, we, we do. Uh, I mean, we have a, a, a mutual friend who's a, a young kid and he just happens to be fantastic at impersonations. And we've kind of watched him on Instagram as he's gone from, you know, somebody who is probably just sending him out to his group of friends. And that expanded when they shared it with their friends. Now this kid is on Howard Stern, impersonating Howard Stern to oh, Howard yes. Stern. Man, hey, that guy, I see that guy yeah, all the time. Exactly. You've seen him. And, and he started just as, you know, just a young kid doing exactly what Rich just said. Yeah. I mean, so that's so that's really good advice. I mean, and it is like the age old advice that a lot of young kind of people struggle with is you just need to write. Like you need to produce stuff like you're saying and write and practice your craft. Um, and, and so, OK, so sticking with screenwriting specifically because, you know, we're screen craft. Um, how did you guys get into screenwriting specifically? Like what was those the resources at the time? And what was it about that <laughs> craft over? I mean, you know, like doing stand up comedy, like you said, you could have written a novel, you could have done all these other things with the same interest. But what was it about screenwriting? Why go that route? Well, I think when when you're in, when you get into, when you want to get into entertainment, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you can cut that <coughs> part out. <coughs> Rich, take over. I got it wrong. When you get in, I just wanted to say that my childhood dream was also for Alec to be on the Saturday Night Live, so I can uh, I can share his memories. Uh, but I, I will say, well, Alec, cost for me. It's I was interested in comedy, and you know, yes, there are comic novels and comics and comic fiction, but by and large, the stuff that certainly I was exposed to, and I think most people are, that makes you laugh, are TV shows, movies too, but TV shows, and then specifically like the cliche, I don't wish I were, I watch reruns of the Dick Van Dyke show. Uh, and I can't count on all my fingers the number of writers I know who were inspired by the very same thing I was, which was watching Dick Van Dyke go to work in a tiny writer's room. Um, and it just seemed both fun and funny and creative. And it has that mixture. I mean, Comedy writing is such a collaborative experience. And Alec is a good actor and does voices on our show. A couple of our writers do. But there's a performance element to being in a comedy writer's room. And it's kind of electric. So it's something that's much more engaged than sitting alone writing. Of course, to get a job and often to write your scripts, you're alone. But a lot of TV comedy is very collaborative. And that's something that I really like. I didn't want to sit in a room for two years and write a novel that I don't think I have in me. I, I enjoy the energy in a writer's room. Yeah, for sure. But that's one thing that we do get a lot of, like a lot of people that I talk to who are trying to break in, they do think of it that way. Being in a writer's room, it's like you kind of get to be a part of this family, you know, and they kind of become like your family. Do y'all mind? I would love to just go into, I mean, we can just kind of go into the show running and family guy. Um, what is like a typical day? Like, I can't even imagine like what is like a typical standard day. If there is any, if there's even such a thing as like a typical day, in the writer's room on Family Guy, like how do you guys collaborate and, and come up with ideas? And I mean, some of the most genius writing ever is on Family Guy. So like, what is that process like landing on an idea that you want to go with versus ideas that don't make the cut and like like a typical day collaborating with people? We, we generally just schmooze until Alex says something really funny. And then <laughs> the not, not true and 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 rich should speak to this because rich has basically plotted out our entire year ahead of time he's you know fantastic at many aspects of uh show running um but in terms of a typical day you know we when the room starts which is at a generous hour of like 10 or 10 30 you know we're not we're not breaking we're comedy writers so it's not like we're racing in to work for nasa um but we divide we have a big staff so we divide into usually three rooms of like six people each and each room will have a specific task for that day one room could be thinking up a new story one room could be working on a, a script that's coming up when we're about to table read it and one room could be working on one joke all day um but in terms of how we arrive on what we want to use, and, and Rich always says this, best idea wins, and best idea wins in terms of story, and the best jokes win. And we know, you know, it's, 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 we like to laugh all day, but at the same time, it's not easy to make us laugh all day. So 
when we're laughing, we have to acknowledge that and say, okay, this is something we want to use. And yeah. it's, and it's, it's such a, um, in a way, efficient process. I mean, if you saw us, it looks like during the day, we are schmoozing. We are hearing about something and watching a clip on YouTube. But the efficiency comes from the performance side. And someone's pitching an idea, and it just lays there. They're not going to waste another four hours thinking, maybe this idea is better than I think it is because they've just had six people kind of look at them and poke a hole in it, or whatever it is, or say we've done it and you move on to the next. And a lot of us, there is a healthy competitive streak in us to want to make one another laugh. And so you go back down and you try different, you know, I always say it's kind of, to me, the metaphor is bumper cars, like you're until you find a path right. and you always know there's, there is, it's obviously not scientific, but there are telltale signs. If I'm in a room or Alec is in a room and I'm doing, so, I, I, I might be looking at an outline or something and I'm half listening. I don't have to hear the idea to know when the good one was because immediately like popcorn all around it, people are pitching on it because people recognize a good idea and they want to be a part of it. And right. it's 99% it's, it's foolproof that the one that gets everyone sitting up straight is something that they instantly realize that's a clever idea. Let's be a part of it. And it's like, go back. What was the thing said three, you know, beats ago? Because that's obviously the idea we're going to work on. Wow. So that, so that the community aspect of it, like that collaboration must be so key. So like, you know, a lot of our community, just trying to extract kind of value for some of the people in our community. What, did, what advice or what would you say someone should do? Who is the person like you were talking about earlier, sitting in the room alone, typing away on a screenplay, like, what do you, what would you tell them like to go get people that can give them feedback? Like where should they go to start to try to get that kind of validation? You know? Well, I will tell you that I think the most important thing a writer, maybe not the most important and important thing a writer can have is a little community. And I say it to my son, who's now 29 and he's been writing and to any younger writers I meet, it doesn't have to be a community of people who are working at network or Amazon shows, it can be people who have a job to pay for their ability to write, which is what all of us pretty much have done. But you can find like-minded people. I have a feeling they're friends. That's probably how they got to be friends. And then collect two people, all, it's all you need, whose judgment you trust, and you'll read their work and they'll read yours. And it gives you deadlines. It gives you, and you know, a friend of mine long ago when I was just starting out gave me his script and he gave me a black Sharpie pen. And he said, return the pen out of ink. And I was like, but, and he was experienced. And I said, but I don't, what if I don't know? He said, I don't have to take your notes, Rich, but don't just hand it back to me and say, I liked it. Put X's through the things you didn't like, checks by the thing, write the questions and I'll process it. And that's the freedom that you have to give a reader. It's, it can't just be, this is great, right? It's right. got to be, give me constructive criticism. Tell me what you don't think is working. And it can be, you know, like I said, it's not, most writers aren't employed. That's the sad fact, right? You know, and I, when I was starting out, I had another job and I was working at a coffee shop writing. And I remember so vividly, I was nursing one cup of coffee for like six hours. And when I got up, I asked an older woman to my left, I said, could you watch my stuff? I'm just going to the bathroom. When I came back, they cleared it all away. And the woman said, I told them a writer was working there. And I was like, no one had ever called me a writer. I hadn't been paid a dollar. But I was like, oh my, I'll never forget that. And I was like, yeah. So, you know, that's the advice I give. Yeah, but also if, if someone doesn't, for whatever reason, if they're an introvert or, you know, they're in a new place and maybe they, they're, having, they're struggling to find that kind of a community, a, a really important thing, especially if you're writing comedy, is just, if you're making yourself laugh, then you know what? That's that's sometimes the best you can do when you're writing, and and you have to have a little faith in your own uh, comedic voice and just say like, "Well, this made me laugh." Like we we do that all the time still. Like when 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 we write something and maybe people don't like it, we say, "Well, you know what? It made me laugh." Like yeah. that's that's got to be a first step. And to echo Al Alec, because yeah, if you are on your own or you are an introvert. Watch the stuff that makes you laugh and watch it a little critically, you know? Think to yourself, I've watched 26 episodes of Blank. What do they have in common? Or what is the structural 
little undercurrent or secret of, of this? Or why are these characters popping off the page after two scenes? You know, yeah. it, you can look at the stuff that speaks to you and matches your sensibility and start thinking, what is it about this? How do they, what's the, you know, scaffolding behind the show? Right. So there's so much good stuff in there. I mean, um, one thing, I guess, uh, uh, kind of going off of everything y'all were saying, let's say that someone has a passion for cinema and TVs and they love watching animation and they just, they want to be a part of it and they make that decision. I want to try to give, give it a go, like whatever that means. What do you think should be their primary focus when they first start? Because a lot of people kind of focus on, I need to get an agent before they even write like a lot of stuff. But what do you think that person who's just starting out should make their primary focus, like writing, analyzing stuff? Cause you were saying how important it is to watch and analyze things critically. And well, I don't, we don't get that a lot of people doing that, you know? Well, I think you probably have, you know, you're, are you, you're dealing with a lot of students right now, right? Is that students for sure. But also we have just a range of like students, but also just really young people that just want to get into it. And, and also all ages, we have people that are 40 and have decided like they want to try to write scripts and submit to contests. So we kind of just have that wide range of people just kind of getting started, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I can't, I th I would say for the, the people who are slightly on the older side, much younger than we are, but uh, I, 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 this piece of advice might not be for them, but for somebody who is young and starting out, you're right. People often say like, I got to get an agent and how do I get this script to them? I think a really good first step for young people is trying to come on in a different position, like a PA or an assistant, because then if you show that, you know, you can, you can be hardworking and good at that, people will inevitably ask you what you want to do. And then you say, uh, well, I want to be a writer. Well, do you have a script? Yes, I happen to. So it, it's a much more organic way for that process to play out, I think, than saying like, where's my agent right away? Yeah. And that's another way to build a community because of course you're self-selecting your group and that the other PAs on a comedy show or the other assistants most likely have the same motivation. And at Family Guy, I off the top of my head, I can think of five writers we have who are all great who started as either a production assistant or a writer's assistant or an assistant uh, mm -hmm. who over time you start to understand, oh, they're really funny. And the next thing they know, will you read my sample? The next thing you know, they're in the writer's room. So I think, I think that's really good advice. And the only other thing is an obvious one, but, uh, you know, I do think right before you look for an agent and I, and I think, you know, get into a habit of it. It's, it's hard to being a writer because everyone in the, everyone in the world assumes your schedule is open. And, you know, I would, I, I remember having conversations with people, they'd say, well, can you come to this thing at five? I say, well, I'm working. And it's like, well, you're sitting at home writing us. I know, but it doesn't work like that. I can't turn it off at five. I'm giving myself until I actually have the scene done. And that might take 5.15, it might take till 11. And you have to take that seriously and give yourself a routine and protect it the same way you'd protect if you were paralegal and the guy said, we're going to trial tomorrow, you've got to mark these documents. Yeah, yeah. man, there's so many, there's so many um, directions I wanna go. Um, I wanna put a pin, like I, I really do wanna talk about routine and like process and kind of what y'all's routines are, but really quickly, just because it's so hopeful to hear you guys saying people started as PAs and production assistants and like worked their way up. What advice do you have to someone that got that job as a PA at whatever, oops, at whatever show it is? And like, what do you look for in PAs? What, what advice would you give to someone to stand out? But also I hear like there's overstepping of boundaries that can happen and that type of thing. But like, what advice would you give to someone? What do y'all look for in people who are at those levels of being an assistant or a PA and everything? Well, I'm, gonna, well? I'm gonna put it in the words of, of someone I know. My, uh, my son on his own un got a job as a PA at a show. And three months in, I got a text from a writer who was there who said, oh my God, I just realized that's your son. And then he gave him the nicest compliment. He said, he's the first in, He's the last to go mopping the kitchen. And he says, when he brings us, and he said, when he brings us our lunches, it's just the right level of engagement and it's not overstaying. And I was like, you're talking about my son. I would think you'd say, pull up a chair, but I understood what he meant. And to me, the number one thing in any job, especially these, 
is work your butt off and have a great attitude about it because we're sitting in a room. I always used to say about hiring people, genius assholes need not apply because it will sink the ship. It's, it's, it's a group endeavor. And one guy who may have great ideas, who's just shooting arrows at everyone. And that's how arrows are fired, by the way, Uh Uh, you know, is going to bring it all down, but it's the same thing for production assistants because everyone knows. And so many people have had those jobs. Yeah. It's kind of go for work. But if you watch someone doing it with energy and a good attitude, you're thinking this is a person who's here to work and doesn't expect shortcuts. And it just through osmosis, you start to get a sense of their character as yes. opposed to, there's a famous story, a family guy before my time, someone was hired who was the nephew of a big executive at the network. And this, and he was hired for the summer and this kid did not have the right attitude. And at one point he was standing next to a writer, Alec and I both know, watching the other assistants pull out the lunches from the lunch cart and label them. And he just changed it. God, can you imagine if that was your job? And the writer sort of, literally says, it is your job. <laughs> you know, that's the wrong attitude. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, what, what advice, you know, just, this is a struggle that a, a lot of writers have a lot of people starting out. Um, what advice, cause you, you guys both have, it seems like you guys have a really great character and it seems like from ta- hearing you talk now that you try to leave ego out of it. And it's kind of a very collaborative process. What do you have? What advice do you have for someone that's just starting that is like, has that ego and has that they're too precious with their work and they don't take criticism well, because like you were saying earlier, being able to not only take criticism, but give criticism on people's work seems to be very important. But what advice do you have on like some of those aspects? Write a novel and get it published. That's what you do if you can't take criticism and your ego is too big. That's, I mean, you can still be a writer. You just can't work in network or streaming television. That's exactly right. I mean, you, you just have to, you, and, and not, to be fair, definitely when I was a younger writer, I had an element of that where I, I certainly had a lot more of that, or I would be embarrassed if something of mine didn't get a laugh or it got cut or somebody pointed it out and said, are we really going to do that? And you just have to lose that. And you do lose that. And especially in the job where we've been fortunate enough to be together for decades now, we all know each other so well. So, uh, you know, we have the advantage of we all have a shorthand and, and, a, sh- and a short memory because when, when you pitch, everyone's going to pitch stinkers and you just have to, it's part of the process. And, it's, and then I would, the, the, I will take one step back because from what I said, it's also a matter of when you do it. Like if you're, if you're pitching a story, for instance, and Alec or I don't really get it and you push back and keep pushing at it and coming up with new ways to sell it to us. I respect that confidence and that ego that you're not letting it die. And you're not just repeating yourself, but you're kind of showing us why we're wrong. If it's been written and we're in the writer's room rewriting it and you hear, and I often do less now, you hear, well, what I was going for there is, and I say, no, no, no. Cause what you were going for is on the page. Right. You won't yeah. be at home telling people what you were going for. And that's the one where you have to quickly go, all right, the group, the room has spoken. This isn't working. But as you're writing it and coming up with a story idea and, and a big swing idea that you think you could, I love people who have the, and sometimes we will say, you know what, go write it. Let's see. And so confidence is important. Yeah. But that's really good. Like that is really good advice. Honestly, just the way that you just put that, like someone who after it's already been written, it's like, they cannot let go of it. That's yeah. such a good way to think about it. You know, it really is. Um, I, I would love to, so just kind of sticking on the same topic and again, just PAs and being a production assistant I'm, and the industry is just, you know, there's just a lot going on right now, but do you, what advice do you have to someone? Like, how do you get a job as a PA or networking? Like what advice do you have to someone try, that lives in LA? Let's just assume they live here. Like what can they do to start making some, some relationships, some friends and getting some of those opportunities? Well, that's a good question. It used to be different when we were coming up. There were uh, things like Backstage, uh, which was a newspaper in New York, and you could literally look it, through the back of it and see jobs that were coming up, that were including writer's assistants, production assistants, things like that. 
that were more realistic for somebody who wanted to kind of break in. I feel like that is kind of gone now, but I, I can only assume that there must be some kind of like general listing at a Writers Guild uh, website or something that has a resource for that. I would, I would, I would believe that too with the guilds. And then also, you know, if unit production managers on live action shows, post-production supervisors on animated shows, send your resume. I mean, it's, you can, email addresses are gettable. You know, it's, it's not, once you've cracked the code at disney.com, it's not so hard to figure <laughs> out. There's only a few ways you can, first name first or second name first, and, um, and send them in, and yeah. send a lot of them in, and say you're looking for an entry-level job, and pitch your work ethic, et cetera, et cetera. And well, and to, to Rich's point earlier about community, um, a big shortcut to having a community is living in Los Angeles because it is, you know, it's a company town and the company is entertainment of all kind. So you can go out to a bar, you know, and, and you meet anyone you meet is going yeah. to be somehow associated with this. And, and, and then it becomes, well, my friend knows this person here or knows someone who's leaving a job or knows someone who's looking for someone to work for a day on a film set. And then there you meet a dozen other people who are also there who might know something for you. So it's really like just by being in Los Angeles, um, that, that is a huge help. Yeah. Um, okay. So I put the pin in this. I really want to, I know you have to leave. I mean, it's 1230 already, so, <laughs> but, but, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to jump off, but Rich is, I can stay. I can stay capable. Awesome. I really All appreciate right. chatting with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank so you, Cole. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk about just routine and process, um, uh -huh. as I know, just, I mean, at y'all's level, the amount of just the amount that you're putting out and the quality of family guy, just co consistently genius work. W what is your process like in the room? Um, even if, even maybe just starting with you alone, writing the discipline of it, you know, which is something a lot of people, we get that question. We kind of get that complaint a lot is like people have a hard time disciplining themselves but for you like what is your habits or process or are there any kind of routines that you really stick well, to on a day it, 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 it differs when i'm writing a script of my own than when i'm running the show and i'll tell you for the latter running a show with a group of writers by far the most important thing is the story idea um mm -hmm. a friend of mine 20 some odd years ago said to me and i love this metaphor the jokes and the bits are the ornaments on the tree. The stories, the root and the branch, you can always get more ornaments. Mm -hmm. And don't be overly wed to any one ornament if it sacrifices the story tree and where you're going. And I've been at, you know, one of the things I do is at table reads, I'll read the stage directions. And I'm telling you, in however many years I've been doing it, a couple of times by page 20 of a 50 page script, I know our story isn't working. It doesn't make sense. There's something that's missing. And the flop sweat I feel and the exertion kind of dragging those remaining 30 pages across the finish line, you never want to experience that. So you realize pretty quickly, just because this thing late in the second act makes me laugh, what is it doing for these five pages? What is it going to do to the momentum of the story? And people? so when you have a, whenever I have a story and, you know, oftentimes writers will work on it and they'll take out all their note cards. And I learned this from another showrunner. He says, put the note cards down. Just tell what's the story. Tell me the story. I don't need to hear every twist and turn. And I took that to heart because when we break a story, if I feel I could pitch it to you, right. And say, uh, this is what happens with Peter Griffin this week. And halfway through, I bet you, through a minute and a half, I bet you you're going to be laughing at something. Not necessarily the joke, but the turn. And then you're going to say, oh, I could see how this would be. And as soon as I can tell that to myself, I sleep easy. Because you can rewrite anything in a few days. Yeah. The draft may need some work. The rewrite may need some work. But especially with the caliber of writers we have, you can always, people come up with inventive stuff. But that story, and it's so important, so push yourself when you think you've got a good story. And the trick I always give myself is, don't just think it to yourself. Tell a friend what the story is. Because as you're talking, you'll realize, oh, this doesn't make, or 
there's not enough there. It really is an easy trick to force yourself to deliver that story pitch to someone in under five minutes to see if they're, and the story pitch may end with the second act break and then the third act, we wrap it up through whatever. Okay, but just be confident enough that that story is something that you're gonna wanna live with for a long time, because in animation especially, but even in live action productions, you're living with that story. The pages might change uh, for a long time. And so in our room, we will have, as Alex said, we have three rooms going at once. One will be a story break room. And you know we have writers send us paragraph ideas whenever they've got them. And we'll okay. you know, res respond. Most honestly, we don't wanna do. Sometimes there's a nugget from one. Sometimes it inspires something from Alec or from me. Sometimes it's a really good idea. So, and then we just sometimes have rooms that have nothing to do that day, no game plan. And it's, we need a good story for Brian and Stewie. And wow. somehow with five or six, you know, funny, interesting people whose lives are interesting, you know, we, we did, I stole Lock, Stock and Barrel, a story that happened to my sister that's coming up next season on Family Guy. And for the purpose of the story, my sister and her husband are grounded, lovely, intelligent, polite people. And uh, their daughter now lives in Seattle with her now husband. They went and they got an Airbnb. And when they came home, my sister thought, oh, let's go back in a month. It was such a nice visit to Seattle. And she realized she got a bad review and was kind of blackballed. And the owner of the house said that the, that the previous guests had stolen items. And my sister, what on earth? She reached out and said, the answer was a half used bottle of shampoo in the shower. And my sister, I didn't take it. Her husband then laughingly said, oh my God, I put it in my toilet kit because it was like half empty. And I thought, do I throw it in the trash? They're not going to want, she offered to give it back. Just let's say she never removed the review and she was banned. So I th thought to myself, this happens to Lois, but she doesn't let it go. And she wants revenge on the woman who's ruined her and embarrassed her in her mom's circles on Airbnb. So anything, and the room then took it in fun, great directions, but anything in your life as obviously all your students know, because that's what's been inspiring, I'm sure a lot of their work to begin with. But, you know, I often, you know, I read a lot of newspapers, hmm. you know, um, online, small town newspapers, you know, I once got an idea from a small town newspaper that said, a man had purposely committed a crime to get out of spending Thanksgiving with his family. So he'd be in jail. And I was like, well, if that's not a Peter Griffin story that goes awry. So, you know, reading that kind of stuff yeah. online can inspire an idea. Well, what um, is it like, like, what is, I, I don't even know a way to kind of phrase this question because story is such a, like, what is it that makes a good story? Or is, is there a formula? I hate to use that word, but is there some kind of like formula when you're pitching a story and when someone's pitching to you? that you kind of stick to in that early stage? Well, I mean, structurally, you know, Family Guy, like The Simpsons, like King of the Hill, you know, are three act shows, like the traditional three act movie. So you do know you need a story turn at each of the first two acts. Um, but there are, I've always said when I, you know, talked about hiring people, um, without fail, you know, I'll read 80 scripts, let's say 60 or no, 10 or maybe, then you read one and it has a voice. There's a character in it who you think I couldn't write that. There's a take on, the structure may not be sound, the story may peter off, but 99 out of 100 times, I'm going to want to hire the person with the voice because the truth is you can teach some of the elements of writing. You know, I learned from really talented people 29 years ago about the importance of stakes, whether they're earth shattering or very, very personal and uh, familial escalation in the story, conflict. I mean, there are structural elements that just because they've been in screen screenwriting craft books doesn't mean they're not correct. Um, but it's what you do with that. It's a friend of mine and I were writing something and recently, and he said, I wanna read this screenwriting book. And I sort of looked at him and said, We've been, 
together we've written like a thousand. And he said something so smart. He said, look, I want to, I'm not saying we've got to follow all the rules, but I want to know which ones we're breaking. And I'm curious to see. And I thought that's interesting. And I, you know, read the book and I was interested to see, but, you know, sometimes rules of structure and stuff become rules because they help a lot. And then you bury it in a different way, or you play off expectations in a certain way. And the voice of the show kind of takes over. Um, but it's, you know, so once you have a story, then we'll devote, you know, we'll, we'll break it. You know, we have a board, we don't have cards, we'll write on a magic marker board. Uh, and that could take a day if we're doing it well, it could take three or four days. Um, then a writer who's assigned to it will go write an outline, which is sort of the board beats, but a little uh, uh, inflated. Just make sure that the story holds together and we'll give notes on that. And then they'll go write a first draft. Um, and we would probably give notes and let them have a few more days. And then it comes into the writer's room. And, you know, a great script might be rewritten 15, 20%. An average script might be rewritten 50%. And one thing that, you know, this could cover a couple of questions you asked, but when I, whenever I, Family Guy, as Alex said, is a group of writers who've been together for a long time, invaluable. When I started new shows, I would have the writers come over to dinner and I'd always say the same thing. I wish I could will us all to knowing one another better, not to feel embarrassed, ashamed, foolish, dumb, whatever it is, because the, the uh, distance between something being stupid and unfunny or stupid and funny is paper thin. And if you edit yourself in a, it's group therapy and we always, you don't talk about what's said in the writer's room. People might be talking confidentially about their marriages, their relationships, their children, and it might inspire an idea. But it's, you know, when you've got that comfort level, there's not, in, we've all had our scripts rewritten, yeah. you know? And once you realize, oh, right, I think that she's great. And I just watched her script get rewritten and he's really, it's okay. And then what I always say to the writers, double down and own your script. You be the person pitching the most for it. And just because we're changing things doesn't mean it's not still going to be your script. And, you know, and at our show, as at The Simpsons, it oh, you know, it's, we never put anyone else's name on it. It's not like Alec or I put our name on it. It's that writer's episode. And then we table read it. We do a rewrite depending on how it goes. And then I think one of the reasons animated shows like King of the Hill and The Simpsons, and I think Family Guy, are as good as they are, is the production cycle gives us what most writers would kill for. And it's time because on a live action show, you have a table read three days later, you're either shooting it or taping it on our show. We do a table read, they storyboard it. They then do what's basically a rough flip book animatic, but we don't see that for three months. Hmm. And by the time you see it again, I don't need notes because I'm watching something. I've kind of forgotten about it. And I'm like, well, that wasn't funny or that made no sense. And we rewrite it. And then eventually it's shipped to South Korea where the color animation is done. And three months later, we watch it in color. So wow. the freedom to put something you've written on a shelf for three months and then take it down again and edit it, huge. But most, you know, most people don't have that luxury. Most shows don't, you know. So I think that's the process and it takes soup to nuts, you know, pretty much 14 months with, you know, because the Simpsons and Family Guy are kind of old war horses that are expensive shows. And they're, you know, if you're doing a new show, you're not going to probably have both that animatic and the color screening because it necessitates tossing out a lot of animation from a hundred animators. Um, but these models are, you know, we're lucky. Yeah, I would, that's amazing. I was going to, I was about to ask you like, what is the process from start to finish? And you just laid it out. That's, that's amazing. And then in between there, you know, obviously we're adding their uh, background designs and, and, and uh, prop design and character design that we approve. And then after that, you know, you're mixing it. And Family Guy, I think, may be the only, certainly the only half-hour show, maybe one, 
that has a full 60 piece orchestra that scores it every week because among many things, music is obviously really important to set. And um, Walter Murphy has been doing, uh, doing that for years and years and years. And we have a music spotting session with, but you know, he's an expert and he knows what he's doing. And um, so that can give a cinematic feel to certain things. It helps the comedy in so many ways. It's just, so there are a lot of elements and a lot of expense. Yeah. In our- well, what, so what is your favorite or not favorite? What, what is your, what is the most fulfilling part of the process for you? Like the thing that brings you the most joy or what is the most meaningful part of the process for you? I'll tell you the thing that makes me happiest and is without a doubt when you're in the writer's room and things are clicking and you're making each other laugh and you're also thinking, oh, this is funny. This is an original idea. People are going to like this. And Danny just made me crack up and Alec just added to that. And, and it's just rolling. That's a high. And I think if you're, if you want to be a comedy writer badly enough that you're willing to put up with the rejection and the difficulty of it all, then by definition, you're a person for whom that is going to be a high because that's what you're doing it for. Another, you know, at table reads when the, you know, our cast is fantastic. And to hear Alex Borstein see a character, you know, description that might say something like woman who'll never have a baby. And she'll, and it's like, that's the, cause we don't, that's just the bit. So sometimes we just, and she kind of looks up like what, what, and she comes up with a voice that you think, well, that's exactly. Right. So it's just the artistry of the actors too, when it comes alive, that's exciting. And table reads, I still, I've been doing table reads since I started The Simpsons in 1994. They're still thrilling. They're still a blast. I mean, that's te- very telling that you, for you, it's it's not like when it goes out to the audience and the reaction from the audience for you, it's that personal with the people that you're in the room with, with your family, you know, like that. Yes, yes. And I, you know, to be honest, if I had created family guy, right. Would I get an extra charge if, if you said what you said at the start of this, if, you know, I spoke at a school and the students that I've done maybe, but I didn't create family guy. I, I feel like, a great uh, responsibility to help keep it really strong. Um, but, and I love it when people say they watch the show, it's, it's, that's exciting and I appreciate it. And I, but it doesn't give me the same uh, spark that I get when it's, when we're creating it and I'm watching it come alive for the first time. Yeah. Do you, I, I'm sorry to ask, what is your time limit for when you have to go? I have a few more things I would love to talk I, about. I can, you want to say for six minutes to 10 to one, because then I can get, I can still make my one o'clock. Yeah, that works perfectly. So you mentioned this, and this is one of the things that I, every person that I chat with, I try to get some value because for, for this specifically, because it's, it's, it's an abstract concept and it's really hard to pin it down. But what, for, what does voice mean? to you like what is voice how do you know when a voice is good and then maybe even more importantly um you can go wherever you want with it but what advice do you give to someone kind of just starting out that hasn't quite found their voice like how do they even know when they start to like figure out their voice you know that's a very good question and the short answer is i'm not sure i know but i will tell you that i think for writers starting out worrying about their own voice right a so-called, you know, a spec script of a show you love. Don't write one that you think, oh, that's going to get me hired. Because Don't write an obscure one that no one's ever heard of, but one that you like because, you know, there's a mixed um, theory in Hollywood that right now by far the prevailing wisdom is among agents and producers, write a pilot as your sample. I and a few showrunners I know, I'm happy to read pilots, yes, I always am happy to read a spec script for, you know, a modern family, whatever the show is, because the job you're being hired to do is to channel the voice of another creator with his or her characters and bring them to life week after week. And you can tell in a spec script of a, you know, Veep or Modern Family, whatever it is, if the writer gets the characters and gets the voice of the show. And so to me, if 
you don't yet know your own voice, and I'm not being facetious, right in someone else's. And I don't mean, oh, you know, uh, Gabe Mandel or, or, or Larry David, but they're characters. And what you're going to find, I bet, is as you do that, certain kinds of characters start inspiring you more than others. And you're going to want to write for that character more or something comic springs to mind more quickly. And then I think you're a step closer to what your voice is because you're drawing from these other characters, things that speak to you. You're not stealing it. You're being inspired by it and you're seeing the light. You know, it's like, yeah, obviously Stewie is such an original, fun character. The people who write, you know, I understand what they're drawn by with, with Stewie, but it doesn't mean that what they create is going to be this man, baby, a feed and electro, whatever it is, but there's something in his voice, his observation, his insecurities. So that's what I would do. And, and I think when you read it, you know, it's like that famous Supreme court uh, oral argument when one of the justices about pornography is I'll know it when I see it. Well, you know, when you read something that makes you stop and, you know, and take notice for me, often it's, you know, a character speaking in a way or with an observation or a line that seems so authentic and something that wouldn't have come to me. You know, I'm not afraid to admit that, you know, I, as Alex said, I always say best idea wins wherever it comes from, whether it's the assistant editor, a junior writer, a showrunner. And I get a thrill being able to say, I just recognized a great idea because yeah. that's part of my job and to celebrate the person who's come up with it. So I love reading stuff where the take, the character, the reaction to something seems authentic and unexpected. Yeah, that's such good advice. Such good advice to start with shows that you love and like kind of mimic that, you know, that's just such a good way to think about it. Um, I like to ask this question. It's kind of like, everyone gives a different answer, but I think it's helpful. Like there's a kind of a thread, but what, what are your thoughts on writer's block? I know it's kind of a random thing, but this is like just the I biggest. Like I, I do have, I have a trick that I'm proud of easily said, and everyone can have it. Whenever I'm stuck and hit with writer's block, which happens to us all. And it's a fancier name for, <laughs> you know, absence of ideas, laziness, exhaustion, whatever it is, I always tell myself the same thing. And it maybe works because I was kind of a type A person my whole life. I imagine that I'm taking a final exam in college. It's nine o'clock. You have to turn in your blue book. I know they don't do that anymore, but you have to hit send or whatever they do at noon. And you sure as hell don't want to turn in nothing because that's a guaranteed F. You've got three hours. Go. Now, at the end of those three hours, you have lunch, you come back. Oftentimes it's like useless, useless, useless. But sometimes there's a half a scene or a line that inspires you in something else. And oftentimes after those three hours of doing it, you're kind of, then you can take a break because you're already back in the process. So for me, it's always, literally I tell myself, it's a final, nine o'clock, sit down. All right. I love that. Let's see what we've got. And I mean, awesome. it works less well if, unlike me, you could tolerate an F. <laughs> yeah. No, that works because it's like, even if it's shit, get it on the page, you know, so you can come back to it and just see what's there, you know. And you can throw it all out. Yeah. You also um, won't, won't be angry at yourself because you won't say, I just done nothing all day. No, you would say, I tried and I got some stuff out. I just didn't like it. Yeah. Well, that, that right there, that little thing, that's like the biggest thing that, that we, that I've noticed, even with myself is like, the uh just the feeling like the self-loathing when I don't do shit all day and like I just waste the day away. So but that's really good advice. So I know it's a it's about time. What just one last question, just quick question. You can go wherever you want with it, but what just general advice would you give someone who is at like a breaking point? They've been trying this for a while. Maybe they're talented, they get good feedback, but they just haven't found a break or an opportunity. Like what just kind of little piece of advice would you give them like, you know, to keep going? Well, you know, I think they probably have people in their lives who would say to them, don't give up. I believe in you. Um, if they don't, you know, and it's, 
it seems glib to say, but try to find friends or family like that who would say that to you. But I have a, a slightly different addition to that, which is it's possible that what you're doing, the very specific um, medium that you've decided to pursue isn't quite suited to you. When I started out um, 30 years ago, um, my wife gave me the most support and encouragement and I was, and I trusted her and I respected her and she's a writer. And, and I said, do you think I can do? And she said, Rich, I do. I think you're a good storyteller. And if I didn't, I would tell you to be a journalist or an essayist. I would tell And so I would say to people, there are many ways to write. There are many types of things to write. Maybe you might be a great thriller writer. Maybe you would be a, a family drama writer, if not a comedy writer. It does, I'm not saying you might be in the wrong, like stop being a writer. Because I think you stop being a writer when you run out of ideas or when the scales tip. And I also say, you know, I've said to my son, you know, when I, there's no one I would give more honest advice to. If he's happy, generally, in the long term, over the course of a year, not day to day, pursuing writing and being a writer, I'm all for it. But I don't place any higher value on that than a lot of other things he might do with his life. And I think, you know, for me, it was a really important thing to pursue. I didn't at first, and I will say this for your listeners, because I didn't have enough courage to do it. I was afraid of doing it. So I went to law school and I was a lawyer for five years and then finally thought this is something I need to do. And I built up some confidence to do it. And then I got a 10 week job followed by, I mean, it turned into a number of years, but I started with a 10 week job followed by another 10 week job, no insurance. And I'm proud of the fact that I, you know, took a swing uh, with, you know, no guarantee. Um, so you always have to be willing to do that. And as long as the possibility of success feels like a good thing, then I think you keep doing it, but you could vary what your ambition is. And I should say, you know, define success properly. It's not, yes, it's, it's, it, people are happy when they're a writer on the Simpsons or family guy or South park or a live action show, but there's other writing something that's respected, writing something that people like, you, you can build an audience. If it's an audience of 20 people you know who've read it and liked it, you should be proud of that, right? I mean, my God, literary history is filled with novelists who died bankrupt, whose works we were all forced to read in college. And, you know, I just think if you define success the right way and you police yourself and your moods and own the possibility that there might be another type of writing that you'd love to do, uh, yeah, then find that friend who says, don't give up. Man, I love that. That's just, I really, I needed to hear that myself. So thank we, you. I tell myself that, you know, it's like, if you don't have a little insecurity as a writer, I mean, you always have to be open to something being better than what you just thought, even if it's what you think of in a week. Yeah. Which makes you throw out what you really believed in last month, yeah. right? That you're always, something could be made better. Yeah. Well, man, th this was awesome. I really, pre I wish, I wish you had more time. Oh, yeah, I would yeah, love to. No, it was really nice. I yeah. enjoyed it too. So stay thank in touch. So and uh, Thank you. It was yeah, really nice. You. Really All appreciate right. it, Rich. Have a good Bye. day.